it's after and I don't think. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Jessica Cobine. I'm a lab specialist in DCBS. And with me tonight, I have Jonah Travick for the DC Buzz. Jonah's had a very fascinating career and uh, I've worked with him recently on several Disney projects. So why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, okay. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a lover of the whole production game, the industry, the art itself. Um, I kind of, I got into it really early when I was maybe 13 or 14 years old, uh, the meet, uh, working in the school media production, doing the closed circuit television uh, for at, in the sixth grade and did that all the way through high school. And then I was even doing weddings. I started working for our uh, local company, helping them shoot weddings. And this is back mm -hmm. in the nineties. Um, so I've had video, I've been had a video camera in my hand since I was probably, like I said, 12 or 13 years old. And uh, that's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, and was make videos, make movies in a sense. Uh, Back to the Future is my favorite movie. And, and it was probably though that movie and a music video, the thriller, Michael Jackson thriller music video. There was a, there's a great documentary. It's probably hard to find now with uh, the behind the scenes of them making the music video. It's not one of those behind the scenes where it's just people talking about themselves in the movie. It's actually showing them working on that, what they call short films before really music videos were a thing. You know, with him, Michael Jackson, John Landis, working with the film editors, the choreographers, the cinematographers, and the whole process just, you know, it had me hooked. And then, of course, Back to the Future was my all-time favorite movie. Anyway, so wanted to do movies my whole life. Uh, so even at that early age, uh, I started finding the opportunity I can to intern. So I've interned, uh, you know, with uh, in, at Universal Studios or different production companies at the time. Going back as far as like that was in high school, did even worked in the production at Kennedy Space Center when I was in high school. And then finally, when I went to college, uh, University of Central Florida um, film program, I was working for Walt Disney uh, Entertainment, not doing video, but still doing, doing more live entertainment, but mm -hmm. it was still production. Um, and my my heart has always been in, in, in working behind the scenes as as a director or producer, I love working cameras, being a cinematographer. Uh, but after I graduated uh, film school, I uh, interned at Nickelodeon Studios and worked on a show. At the time, it was another show called Games and Sports. It was a Nickelodeon for first digital, they called it digital network, when things were going digital on cable. Mm -hmm. Interned there um, as a production assistant, doing craft services, doing whatever they needed. Um, and then once the internship ended, I worked, they were a new show coming on called uh, Slime Time Live. And they were saying, hey, uh, do you want to work on this show? It's only going to be a 10 week show, but we can bring you in. And they hired me as an assistant coordinator. Uh, my job was to assist the coordinator, you know, with when it's printing out and it's distributing schedules, ordering lunches and Craft, getting craft service ordered, even though we had a craft service PA, uh, just doing whatever they needed, you know, as a coordinator or assistant. Uh, but then during rehearsals, um, we, during, during, it was a live show. Slime Time Live is going to be a live show, but they call it an interstitial, which means it's between the programming. So if you're watching Bun, uh, SpongeBob or Fairly Godparent, Our Parents or Hey Arnold, when they would go to commercial, we would come live to Universal Studios, which at the time is where Nickelodeon Studios was. And we would do in that two to three minute commercial break, we would do those messy double dare, like the old game show, double dare game games live on the air with the live studio audience, either inside or outside and, and someone over the phone being the mm -hmm. phone contestant. Um, and then we would say, okay, we're here after we play the game, like here's more hang on them, stick around, we'll be back. So it was, that's why they call it interstitial. So it wasn't a show, it was an interstitial. Uh, anyway, they said, hey, uh, during the live rehearsal, they said, Jonah, we need, we don't have a co-host for the for David, the main act, main the main host. Do you mind just helping us do the camera blocking? You know, just play, just go along and as we do the blocking. I'm sure some of you know what uh, blocking is and technical rehearsals. So we go through the whole process of being live. I'm kind of a ham, so I just had fun with it. At some point they were, I didn't realize, unbeknownst to me, they were looking at me, hey, he's kind of funny. 
let's see how he works. So after about two weeks of rehearsals, they said, John, we still haven't hired an actor for this part yet. Do you want to just do it for the first week of the show? I said, yeah, it'd be fun. So <laughs> I'll be on TV for a week. It'd be great. Great fun. So, well, we did it for a week and then a week became two weeks and three weeks. Next thing you know, I was on the show the whole season and became a big part of it. However, I was still a statistic coordinator. So then there'll be times when I would come to work at seven in the morning and, and prep the show and do all the stuff I have to do. And we have guest stars come on the show to promote their movie or TV show like Nick Cannon or Christina Aguilera, not Christina Aguilera, Christina Duvall. Uh, I can't think of everybody. A lot of the boy bands were big at the time were coming on. And this is 20 years ago. So I can't think of everyone, but Nick Cannon, for example, I never forget one day I, he comes in, I greet him, I bring him into the studio, show him his dressing room, give him a script and say, hey, you need anything, let me know, I'll order you lunch, waters, whatever. He's like, cool. So I'm ordering his lunch. And then two hours later, I come to the, to the dressing room and I'm in the makeup room. I'm sitting next to him, getting ready to get my hair and makeup done. He's like, dude, I thought you were the, I said, yeah, I am, but I'm co-host too. So I would work on the show all day long and then doing pre-production and then do the show for three hours. And after the show was done, I'd have to go back to my desk and do all the paperwork that stacked up while I was on set for four hours playing TV host. And so after the first season of that, I was like, it was great, but they wanted me to come back. I said, I got it. I only could do one or the other. So they decided to keep me on the air. So I did that show for about four and a half years from 2020. I mean, I'm sorry, 2000 to 2004 or five. We were on live TV every day for four and a half years. But then um, when that ended, um, I, my, true, my true love and passion was behind the scenes. So I went back behind the scenes and worked as, a, and had to kind of start over because people now looked at me as talent and not as someone just out of film school who was, a, who was being hired for production assistant gigs and different mm. type of PA work. Now I'm the, hey, don't forget, I'm still production guy, but people thought of me as talent. So I kind of had to start over and get my, get my reconnect with everyone, let them know what I really can do, what I, what I want to do. So then I've worked at a production company as production management for about two and a half years. And then in 2008 is when I went freelance and do what I do now. So to answer that, my long way of answering that question is I, I'm kind of a predator in a sense. I, I shoot and I edit and I produce or I produce, shoot and edit, depending on who the client is and who the job is for. I would say probably 60% of my work, 70% of my work now as I'm getting older is editing and I'm fine with that because I can stay in this air conditioned studio space and sit on my butt. That's why I've gained weight. But I like, I, what I love about editing is the, how you kind of, you, 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 you put stories together. You're, we're storytellers at the end of the day. And that's where, yeah, I think you really can put together the story once you bring all the content in. And I still, like, like you said, just we work together. I, I work with you as a shooter. So I shoot, mm -hmm. I still shoot. Uh, some of my clients I shoot and edit. And um, I kind of do it all. I can be a production manager, a producer for you as well and never touch any equipment. Um, I, I pride myself in being kind of well, well versed in every aspect of production. I know enough about every area where I can contribute wherever I'm needed on a set. And I think that's what's been my, my key to, I guess, relative success is being able to jump in where I'm needed, whether it's audio, lighting, grip, craft services. <laughs> Uh, being a producer and director, I've kind of done it all. Uh, but I will say the majority of my work is editing and shooting. And I have clients where I do kind of the whole thing and I hire people um, to work with me as needed. Um, what I love the most, I, I just, I love this work and just doing, just doing our craft. Um, I didn't get in this business for the money and the fame and the glamour, um, which is always a possibility. But if you, I just truly love the craft and, and, and I feel blessed that I get to make a living doing what I really think is a hobby. And it's, it's a hobby that will allow me to buy the expensive toys like cameras and monitors and computers and have an excuse and a, and a, and a hobby and a, and a job that'll pay for it. So if you guys are in this business now or jumping into it, you, you're jumping in a great time. Let me tell you, I've seen this business grow. When I came in, in 95, when I graduated high school and graduated college in 2000, it would take, you, you would have to have a 52, a minimum $50,000 investment in equipment to do the quality of work we can do now for under 10. 
I think that's crazy, but it's, it's amazing. And what has happened is the internet has created a beast that we cannot feed enough uh, uh, it, uh, with a thirst for content. Everybody needs content. They need video content. So, and it doesn't matter where you live anymore. You don't have to be in Hollywood. You don't have to be in New York. You can do it anywhere. And it's just an exciting time. And, and the cost of entry has brought it down to we all, anyone can participate. You just have to be creative. Um, there are some people in my field uh, who's been in it as long as I am that are a little threatened by the fact that, you know, you students with whatever package you get as a student, you can go out and do television broadcast quality work and look just as good as these people <laughs> who are used to doing it with half a million in equipment. So, um, so they're a little, they're, some are threatened, but I'm not. I'm smart enough to realize, hey, I can hire these young people with these fresh ideas and fresh new looks and keep me, keep my business and my work relevant. But um, I just, you, you couldn't be in a better time. That's, I can, I can talk all about that all day. I'll, I'll stop there so you can ask us questions, but I'm so excited for any student who decided to take on this field because there's, there's enough work for everybody to eat. Trust me. Definitely. Yeah. Do you have a favorite memory or something that you've done that you were super proud of throughout Absolutely. all this? I mean, obviously that Nickelodeon thing is, I mean, I, that's really cool. <laughs> I'm most proud of, you know, that's how I started my career. And it's, it's kind of hard to top that. And you've had people on DC, uh, on these DC buzzes that worked on that show. I'm like Randy, like I saw mm -hmm. one with um, Randy Baker, Randy Schaefer, Randy Schaefer, who you've had on here was our lead cameraman. And I learned from him. I've learned from Randy Baker. Randy Baker um, is one of our teachers. Exactly. Um, and a lot of those guys will tell you when Nickelodeon was here, it's probably the, a lot of them will still say it's the best job we all ever had. So what, what I was telling someone last night about this was really cool is we are, we, we used to, it was before Instagram and social media and, um, and, the, and everyone didn't have a camera in their hand or on their phone. If they did, it wasn't good quality, but we would line up and take pictures and sign autographs at the show. And it'd be two or 300 kids lined up and take pictures with us. And I think about it sometimes how I'm, I'm in family albums and we did it for four years. So I'm in family albums. Like, you know, we used to print photos all over the country. <laughs> Every once in a while, someone will post something online. It'll be a picture of me from their family album that they that's took 20 me. years ago. And I think that's pretty special because I'm, I'm, I'm in people's family albums <laughs> for all over the country. Um, I can't imagine what it would have been like if we did have social media. I kind of missed out on that because I'm pretty sure I would have had a blue check mark. Mm -hmm. That would have been cool. But I don't, I don't have a blue check mark anymore. <laughs> or don't have one because I'm not famous anymore. But I will tell you, my two co stars, like the young lady in the picture on the cover, she definitely has a blue check mark. <laughs> and our main host, Dave, they have the check mark. Dave Azer and Jessica Holmes, you can look them up. But um, I'm very proud of that. But other than that, though, uh, I'm just proud of my catalog or variety of work i've done everything from working in reality to live tv i do a lot of uh i do a lot of corporate and um lifestyle work mainly because that's what we that's the market we have here in florida um and i'm fine with that i still treat it like i'm doing a movie whether it's a training video or a promotional film um now my biggest client would be disney i'm not an employee so i don't get i'm not a cast member so to speak but mm -hmm. Most of my work is for Disney. Um, I have several clients at Disney, different producers that are working on different projects for different pro departments, like the one I'm working on here behind me. And each producer, I kind of treat like a different customer, a different client, even though it's all for Mickey as a whole. But um, it's kind of cool. And they all kind of Disney Institute, uh, hashtag Disney Kids, Run Disney. This here is Disney's Dreamer Academy which is a big, big show. I'm pretty proud to be a part of that this year. So the variety of work is, is what I'm most proud of because I'm never, never bored. Every project is different. It's definitely really neat how many clients you get from Disney. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, and I, it's, it's all Disney, but they're all different clients with different needs and, and even different styles of the work. It's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's like a government contractor almost. Or, yeah. or it's like being a, being a contractor for a big government agency. <laughs> I mean, here in Florida, Disney is definitely one of the big clients for a lot of us, but um, our students are all over the world and they're mostly learning how to be 
kind of everything, which is what you do too. So do you have any advice on breaking into the industry now for the uh, for the students that are here tonight and the ones who are watching? It's definitely has changed from 20 years ago or 20 more, 20 plus years ago, because like I was mentioning earlier, the, the, the cost of entry and the, the, the gates has gotten lower. I don't mean lower in terms of ability, it's just, it, it's opened up to us all now, mm -hmm. you know? And so my biggest advice is just go do it. You, you're, if you got a cell phone now and you have ideas and you have creative vision, you can be a filmmaker. You are a filmmaker. Just say you are a filmmaker and just go make the films. I mean, in fact, I knew Steven Spielberg, I read something, I saw an interview years ago where he said that 30 years ago. And that was when they were still shooting film where not everybody could afford to get an Airflex and go and spend $100 a minute for film. So, mm. but he said that even then, we know he, well, he was meant to do it with the eight millimeter, which most people had then. But my point is, I think that's still relevant now. Just, just go do it. And, um, just, get, just go out there and do it and then and find a way to show people. You have YouTube now and, and different social media where people can see your work. TikTok, one of the best things, I'm on TikTok. I don't post anything. I just like to watch the content. And what I've been in, in amazed by is and learned recently, I mean, I laugh on TikTok. I cry. I learn. I'm educated, informed, all these different things on this one platform. And, and, and it's all from regular people. They're not all news anchors. They're not all comedians. Mm -hmm. but I tell you what, we got some, there's some funny people in this world. They're hilarious, regular people all over the world. They're creative people. They do amazing films and videos I'm seeing on TikTok. And there's every, and my, what it showed me is that we all have the same ability. We don't need the people that show up on our TV every night or every day to do it. And these are all people just going out there and doing it. And they're now turning this to, which was a little hobby, now turning into careers. And it's, it's, that's my only advice, just go do it. Now, if you ask me more specific advice or questions about your specific situations where you are and where you live, I can be more specific and give you advice. But as a whole, since I know everyone here is from all over the world and different demographics and ages, to be more relevant to everyone, I would just say, just go do it. There's nothing stopping you but yourself. Definitely. Well. I know you said when we talked before that you would love to get lots of questions from everybody. So why don't we open it up to questions now and let uh, anybody who wants to unmic or type in the chat, unless everybody's going to be super quiet. <laughs> you can ask me questions. I you know you know I can talk. I was trying to be uh, controlled here. <laughs> Hey, I actually have a question. Um, I'm I'm really um, admired like your entire career because I have several interests um, within the music and uh, TV side um, as well as film. Um, so I'm pretty much trying to figure out how to um, gain that you know um, foundational experience and um, also further down the line freelance myself. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, yeah. when you were first starting out as a freelancer, were the clients solely coming to you or did you have to pitch yourself and how did how did that look? That's a that's a super question. Great question. So very good question. Yeah. And and it, and it's and everybody's story can be different. My story is, and I think, but I believe a lot of us will agree to this, uh, including Alan and uh, you, Jessica, who are on here that mm -hmm. I know. When you um it's it's about networking. Every job that you do, every client you work with, those usually that's how everything is led to meeting someone else. You usually meet other freelancers on projects that go on to other projects, and then someone say, Hey, we're, oh, my normal cameraman is booked. Do you know anybody? Oh yeah, I know someone. I worked with him on this project last month. That's really how it happens. And that's probably how most of us get our work. I've never went and pitched myself like how you might, if you were to say you wanted to pitch a studio or network to do your show or do your movie, you got to go pitch that most of the mm. time. But the freelance work is really just networking from job to job. You meet more people, more people. Let me tell you, it's a small business. This is very, they always, people say it's a small world. It's even a smaller world than our industry. Everybody knows everybody. My 
don't talk about nobody. Don't say anything bad about nobody because you don't know who's listening. And you could probably take that advice any job, any career, but really important in this one because it's very small. So um, my advice there is that uh, just make the best impression as you can on each project and meet everyone you can in, in, every, in every department. Um, and, 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 you know, because that's really how my work came. It's all word of mouth. Uh, and it's usually someone I worked with referring me for the next project. And the more you do that, just like anything, it just it gets grows from there. Then you get to a point where you get so many people calling. One day you'd be lucky enough to, you know, you might have to turn things down because unfortunately everybody needs everything the same week. So, and you know that, Jessica, yes. you know, you'll, I'll get, won't have anything for two weeks. And then all of a sudden it's feast or famine. Then everybody's calling for the same three days, like. Did y'all have a meeting and we're all going to shoot these three days? That, so that's that's the tough part of this, this industry, though. But I'll tell you what, um, I, I don't know if I can ever go work full time. I've had opportunities to go work for companies full time doing what I do. And, and I've turned them down. That's they're going to like triple my pay. And I'm not saying I'm making a ton of money. What I'm saying is it's going to take a lot for me to go full time somewhere because I love the freedom of choosing the projects I work on, the jobs I work on. I don't turn away much, but still, if I don't want to do a job, I don't have to. And um, and, it, and I keep the variety in all these different places, different things. You can't beat that. Um, I, I like to, I've been fortunate to mostly, there's been a few projects and clients I won't ever work for again. People who've made the job a job. I told you this is my passion. And I have fun. And most of the clients I work with and product producers I work with, we have a good time. And I, I don't like working with people that make it <laughs> that make it a um, make it a job. <laughs> but you're you're right. Um, autonomy is priceless, and that's the that's the best part of this. I saw that in the chat. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I, and I think I hope I answered your question. Um, but that's it's really that simple. It's just really just you know. Um, from job to job. And I'm not saying people don't go in and pitch themselves. The other way to get in is uh, if you're really starting out, you can offer to intern. People will, they, let, they love interns in this field and they can abuse it any like any anybody, but, um, but it's always a good way to jump in if you get an opportunity to intern and also work on student projects or other independent projects. People are producing movies or shows, they don't have any money. Get on those because you can network and meet people there. Uh, the camera people you had before, um, the, the husband and wife team that I, I main name slipped my mind. I worked with them as well. They worked on my student films when I was at UCF. Now, you know, they're veterans. They're, they've been in, they have 20 years on top of me, but they came and helped me out on my student film. Uh, his, his wife, what do you, can you remember, someone give me, tell me, tell me the name. I always, I feel bad. I can't think of the name right now. I'm she came and operated the jib. Yeah. I need a jib shot. And they owned a jib and, and she operated a jib for me one time. And and I learned, and like I said, and they're they are very incredible. They've been they're they're legends in Orlando. <laughs> but um that's that's the that's my answer to that question. <laughs> well, well, that was a you. good answer. Yeah. Uh Nicholas asked in the chat, would you say word of mouth is a greater is greater than advertisements? I mean, I would say definitely, but you want I would to say definitely. Here's, here's why. Here's why, though. It depends on what type of production you're trying to do. Like, people ask me, do I advertise? When I first, first started freelancing, a lot of us will do weddings and event videography um, as a way to kind of, we want to do commercials, you know, but I can get some weddings and I can pay for my equipment. If you're doing that type of clientele, advertising works. But I've never had a, when, when you're starting doing a professional level where you're working for businesses or production companies, so B2B, business to business, I've never found advertising to work for that. It's, that's always been word of mouth, even when you're trying to get an agency to call you or just a, a creative a creative director at a production company or a creative director at a, a at agency. It's all been word of mouth. I'm not saying advertising doesn't work. It all depends on your type of clientele. My clientele wouldn't look for me in an ad. My clientele would, would call a colleague of theirs and say, 
who did that commercial for you? Who did that promotional video for you? Who did that website video for you? And then they refer you. So it's just like, it's just the same as what I was saying with the, um, with getting the freelance jobs. Mm. Oh, thank you. So that's, and, uh, and, but again, if you are trying to do videos for do weddings, of course you want to advertise in the wedding trades. Uh, if you're trying to get, um, if you're trying to advertise to do small business videos, like for the local restaurants, local baker or local barber, and they need video for their social media or web content, absolutely, you can. There's ways to advertise to them. An easiest way is create content and put it on the on the different streams for that clientele to see it. So I'm not saying advertising doesn't work, or but. What's better is for the, you got to think about who you're trying to target and where they will look for you. That's great advice because every situation is different. And a lot of times it's who you know and who knows you. But right. advertising could work if that's the kind of clients you want to take on. So, right. And, and here's where it works when, it, when there's someone who needs the work but knows no one in the field and never mm. doesn't know anyone who's ever done it, they may do the Google search or look online and look for websites. So that's when that works. But I just feel like the type of, most of the clients that I target, they are typically, I found that they're not gonna look for me in a magazine ad or in a, even an internet ad. They're gonna ask someone. Which makes sense. Yeah. Joel asked in the chat. LinkedIn, oh, LinkedIn, I'm hearing it's great. I actually need to do better. <laughs> LinkedIn is great too. I just, I need to do better on LinkedIn myself. Joel? I think we all need to probably work on our LinkedIn's. What would you say is the best way, or even more specifically, what website is best to find a video slash film post-production job? You know, I would have known that question better maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I don't know. I know those actually are good. 10, 15 years ago, I st when I first started, I was getting things on Craigslist, seeing postings there. I don't know if Craigslist is even around anymore. I'm, I'm at a stage now, though, where I'm not actively looking for them. So what, what works now or what websites that I may have used may not be the right case anymore. A lot of those sites have come and gone. Um, I know of one, and there is one. I, I'll look on my email while we're talking. And I might put it in the comments if I find it. I signed up for one. There's a crew site in LA. I'll look. I don't want to. I'll look. I will post it. Um, but it's in LA. I don't know of any. Well, I forgot. We're not all here in Orlando. So I shouldn't even assume that. Uh, can I ask Joel where you geographically located, if that's appropriate? Then I can maybe have some ideas. Yeah, if he wants to put that in the chat or come on mic. And Either yeah, way. Well, yeah, I, I'm actually up uh, in the Pacific Northwest, just north of Portland, Oregon. Oh, there's a lot. I know there's the ones out there out west. Uh, I'm going to post one that I I got an email about. So I would say my answer to that is they there are several of them out there I know, and most of them are geographic. I'll tell you one I used to use was called um, there. There was a company called Turn Here. It's now called Smart Shoot. And what they did was they were like a referral, they were like a referral service in a sense. Like if I was a local business in let's say in Chicago and I wanted someone to do a video, um, I would go to their site and and smart shoot would find a local uh, freelance person in that market that they could outsource the job to. And then they Smart Shoot would collect the payment. Smart Shoot would pay me, and they would handle all the contracts. Smart Shoot would take their cut out, and I do the work. And what they did was they had a network of filmmakers all over the world. I think at one point they had like three thousand when I first got on it. And we were doing ads for YellowPages.com and eight, which became AT and T. And they, I don't think they do those anymore. And well, eventually they started doing it for. The one that's on when you do your Google search now, I forget the name of it. There's a they show video clips. But my point is um they just had a network of filmmakers and they they still smart shoot is still around actually. Um I don't do as I don't do as much work for them anymore. But at one point I 
I one year I did like 300 videos in like a year and a half, two years. Wow. It was, uh, and I really learned, and I didn't pay great, but the mm. volume was so great that I made money. And the best part of it, it made me really fast. Like I can, what would happen is they would, the way they would pay you was paying so little. They, the, the customer would get 90 minutes for us to come in, film their video, get an interview, do some, get some sound bites, do some B-roll. And we come back and edit a minute and a half video that would go on the, on the at and yellowpages.com. And they could also use it on their website. Now you had to be fast. Cause if you, for what they were paying at the time, which was about $300 for a video, you don't want to spend more than five hours on this. And then you're not making any money. But I started doing two and three a day and got so fast and so efficient at editing and shooting. So I, now I'm at the point now I can walk on, on set, sight unseen, and figure out what I'm going to shoot, make it happen fast, and go and edit it fast. So it was a real, it was like a boot camp for me for two years um, doing these almost cookie cutter type videos. But it was a great learning experience. It was great. And a lot of those clients I was able to flip. Some of them were AT&T and Yellow Pages customers. But when they wanted to do another video, they they knew my number still. They found my email and they came to me direct. I flipped a few of those to my nice. own client. So I say all that to say there's Smart Shoot is still there, but there's other companies similar to that. I know they're still out there. I just don't work with them anymore because my rates are probably too high now that I can't get their work. But it's a great way to find, especially if you're not, if you're not in a big city, a big market. Mm. Smart Shoot was great for people who lived in more rural areas or who didn't live near a, a big metropolitan where the work could be limited. It was a great, and those are the clients that might need advertising and a service to find someone like you because they don't know where to go. There's no, there's no Universal Studios down the street. So those are great ways to get um, relatively um, modest pay work, but great work to network, get other clients and, uh, and just kind of hone, get better at your craft. I highly recommend, I'm glad you asked that question. Thanks, thank you. Just go awesome. online and find who's in your area to do that. And um, if I can think of more, I'll put that in the chat too. But smartshoot.com is one I used. And there's one, there's another one called um, Quick Frame. Quick Frame is who I'm using now. Quick Frame is, is high-end stuff though. I'm not saying I'll go for it, I'm just saying, it's high and stuff. Their, their jobs are major national campaigns. So you're competing and you have to put a pitch, you submit a pitch online. And I, I've only gotten a couple of those. They're hard to get, but they have, but I see why. I've seen the people that get the work are doing incredible work. So it made me up my game. So check out Quick Frame, but don't, don't do better. Don't out pitch me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, People might also want to check out their local film commissions. I know some of them have crew lists that you can sign up for, and mm -hmm. that's another way. And then make sure it's on your LinkedIn. Here's the advice I give people too: um, with your social, if you're on social media, post your work. If you if you have a job you do that you can post it, and it's not everything I do is not appropriate for me to post on social media. But if you can post it, if not, take if it's appropriate take photos on set. If you can't show what you're shooting, just show you and your camera, show you with the headphones on, show you working in production. What that does is it lets your people in your network who are following you know what you do and you're reminding them what you do. They may not need you now, but it's, it could be three months from now, they're in a conference call, conference call, say, guys, we got to do a video for this. We, we, did anybody know anyone? Oh yeah, you know, Jessica, yeah, she just posted. She was on set. I think she works. She does movies. She does videos. And they'll call you. They'll text you. Hey, don't you do this? Just do it in a way that you're not annoying, but it's an easy way to remind people what you do because one day they might need your service. That's the freest and cheapest advertising you can get. And that's great advice across the board, no matter what position you're doing. Exactly. And, that, and, and whatever your position in production is, just do it. Then, then, pe then people know that you work in the field. That's, that's a good one. Shelby, that's a great question in the chat. You were unmuted before. Do you want to ask it again? or? I asked a few, but I'll uh, try to condense oh, it. Oh, staff me up. You, you've asked a couple, yeah. Yeah, so my uh, 
My first question was really just trying to understand the difference between an intern and a coordinator. Um, because a lot of times I'll see some people, some companies are very specific with yeah. what they want. Mm -hmm. And then some others, it's, they don't, as long as you have a diploma, <laughs> you're yeah. good. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what's the be the best angle, like to, I guess, is it better to shoot for an intern prior to a coordinator or? Well, internships are just getting you on set, getting you in the all production office. Getting um, your foot and in the door. Getting your foot in the door. And an intern, you can be an intern in any department. And any and you when they hire you as an intern, mm -hmm. you do almost anything. Some jobs will be more specific in what they want their, in, their intern to do or what they're looking for. Some just hire people because they need breathing bodies. And then once you're there, they'll figure out what you'll do. And then my advice back then is still is when you be, when you become that inter, that intern, become invaluable. No matter what it is, just be be make it do the best you can so that when your internship is scheduled to end, they're like, oh, oh man, uh, Shelby used to do this, and now her internship's over. Ooh. And then you, they're kind of forced to hire you because they don't want to lose you. So do that whenever you can. And it, it doesn't always flip into a job. But if you go with the attitude of everything you do, some, it will work sometime. I had a, um, a, the general manager of Nickelodeon when I was a craft service guy at Nickelodeon when I first started there. Um, I was doing craft service and I was, I made it, I made craft service look like I was a caterer. Some, now there's different. You have craft service people and then you have caterers. You ever notice mm -hmm. the difference? A caterer, they they keep their mind about the display and the um, the presentation, which is important. A lot of productions don't have the budget to have a craft service and a caterer. They may have one or both, or and catering is usually more expensive. The point was they just had craft service. You know, people throw out some cookies and soda, some fruit, and is and didn't keep it maintained. He noticed one day that I, I kept the table um, presentable, that everything looked nice and neat. It made, it looked inviting and she wanted to taste the stuff that I had. What he caught, and I, he noticed I had, I didn't just have strawberries, but I had strawberries and I cut the top off a little green leaves off, chopped them. And I had a little dipping of chocolate. <laughs> Blew his mind. And then what he said, well, he said, you know, I admire what you did there. And he said to me, and he he was he goes back to the start of, of MTV. He's big. His name is Scott Fishman. I'll never forget. He said, um, he said, um, craft service, people don't really pay attention to it, but it's the most important thing on the set. You got the most important job on this set. Is that you pay attention when it's not there. And that you pay attention to detail. And he says, I don't care if you're sweeping the set floor, you'd be the best damn floor sweeper there is and have an attitude because people will recognize your, they'll notice your um your attitude and your and your mindset when you're doing the, the menial jobs because you have pride in that. Imagine what if we gave him if we gave him this responsibility. And he told me that, and I never forgot that. So that's been my thing my whole career. So no matter what I was doing, it I did it like it was I was the best floor sweeper. I was the best at whatever I was doing, or just took pride in it. And I might not be that great at doing it, but I did it with the right attitude. People will recognize it. Because people want to work with people they like. They want to work with people with good energy and good attitudes. So um, did I answer that question? I think I did. Somewhere in there, that question was answered. <laughs> and one of the easiest things I found out on set is if you're on a set with like coffee, always make sure the coffee is filled. Coffee. Don't let water run out. Water. Always come around with waters if you have the chance. And people, people notice, but, uh, but like I said, the, um, oh, the, and you, you asked my intern. So now coordinator is a specific position. Typically a coordinator mm -hmm. is working under production manager. So you have your production manager that's in charge of hiring, you know, below the line crew, the schedules, organizing locations and all that stuff. The coordinator just basically assists the production manager in those tasks. So don't get intern and coordinator mixed up. I just, they, they, I went from intern to coordinator. A coordinator can just, and it's not much different than a coordinator or a PA. Sometimes there are productions like MTV and Nickelodeon were notorious for it of trading pay for title. So 
we won't we won't hire you as a PA. We're gonna call you associate producer, but you might just be a glorified PA. And there's sometimes associate producers are really big producers. I think a associate producer is more of a uh, is kind of a coordinator under a producer or executive producer. Mm-hmm. So don't get too caught up in the title when you get when you go for work. Look at the job description and what your responsibilities are. Because that will tell you what you're going to learn, who you're going to work with, the experience you're going to get. And the more seasoned people will, will know what they're looking at. when they, they won't even care about the titles you've had. They just want to know what you did on the job or what you can do and what your portfolio can show. Yes, always do water on yeah. two or three waters in your hand, ready to give to people. Great advice, Alan. Right. Any advice and uh, any advice on work life balance in this industry? I know it can be fast paced and stressful. I'm a disabled veteran and tips is greatly appreciated. Work life balance. This industry has been um, known and notorious for not respecting that. Mm. Work life balance, I'll just be honest. Um, and it's going to depend on who you work for. Um, the production company or the producers, I'm big on it, um, uh, cause. But you might when you start, you might not have that. You honestly may not have that uh, that choice to dictate the work life balance. I think people are getting better and they're trying to be because because that work life balance thing has become an issue of safety. You heard a lot about different accidents and things happening on on big productions when people are overworked. This is big and and you know, uh, working 12, 14 hours and having to drive home and have a three, four hour turnaround before I have to drive back. So that's, that, that issue exists. And the issue is if it's gonna be up to you to decide if you're gonna accept it. Um, and you may feel like you kind of have to in order to get the jobs that you want and to get where you want. That's the unfortunate truth. I will say it does get to a point where you get a point in your career where you can be more selective in the jobs you take and, and maybe not want to work for a project because you expect those that situation. But at least the industry is taking note of it and the unions are trying to correct that with the contracts and with their expectations of the crew. But it is it is it's definitely an issue. That's why I also like editing. <laughs> Because um, now we're editing more and more from home like I am here. And um, you can work around the clock and or not. You can pick your hours. But when you shoot, you, if you got to shoot a sunrise shot, you got to be there two or three hours before the sunrise. You can't change the time God wants the sun to come up. So sometimes it's not always something you can control. <laughs> great question. Also, that's great question. Also that's going to be time. up to you. That, that's going to be more up to you, though, how you yeah. handle that. That's a great uh, time to go and learn the other people you're on or get to know the other people you're on set with, because if you get a job that you're going to only have like four hours turnaround the next day to go do the yeah next job, you could say, I'm sorry, I can't take this one. I've already got another commitment, but here's this person. I've worked with them and they're great. Mm-hmm. And they'll remember that, hey, you recommended this person and hopefully they are a good person that you recommended. Right, absolutely. All right, do we have any other questions? I like the truth too. (laughs) (laughs) Staff me up and then we... I'm just looking through the chat. Yeah, I I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss any questions. I did see a couple bounce by and wanted to make sure we covered those. Yeah, Joel mentioned the video editor jobs. A lot of them are working remotely. Mm -hmm. Now, that was already starting to happen, the remote work. I was doing that occasionally for Disney. And in some jobs and clients, I had to be at Disney Studio. Um, And with with us all having these home editing systems now, it's, and, and then COVID, is made remote editing happening more and more. So that's why I invested in my, my edit suite. Well, since we have an editor in here, why don't you go and uh, give a little information about your home studio here? You said right before you had just put in a client monitor. Yeah, I put in, well, I, I guess, 
So I, this is my setup here. You have, um, I have the, the three monitor area here and above it, I have the big 55 client monitor. Behind me where I'm sitting now, there's like a little small two seat sofa. So a client can sit here and watch. And, and can, most, I mean, the thing is most editors, most producers still now with apps like Frame.io and Screenlight, we can, we can send rough cuts remotely and get feedback remotely. So they rarely come sit with you anymore. That's, that's not as common as it used to be. So, which is good when you having to work from home. Mm-hmm. And now I will tell you about my setup, which makes it special though, is that, um, is that uh, it's detached from my house. Like it's like an in-law suite. Mm. So the beauty it has its own bathroom, separate entrance. So the beauty here is a client can come here and not feel like they're intruding on my family. It's not like they can hear the family or the kids or the dogs. And when you have late hours or early hours, that makes them feel more comfortable because they don't feel like they're interrupting a family. So this, this made it really client friendly being able to do that. That's not always, I didn't always have this. I've only been here two years, but I didn't always have this set up. But um, if you have to do it in your house, remote work is, is the thing now. And that's the good thing about being an editor now too. There are times with certain clientele like Disney and major studios where going, working remotely may not be possible if you're working with a lot of, um, especially um, IP stuff that they have to protect don't want it to leak out. So you have to go to your studio today because they don't want you bringing home footage from the Iron Man shoot. I said Iron Man because I think Joel, somebody had, not Joel, somebody had that behind him. That's why I thought of it. But um, you can't always take home that content. So they need you to be on their, on their building, their facility uh, to secure the content. And this is a great setup for trying to create that work-life balance too because you physically have to get up and leave your house kind of in order to go to work yeah the, it's good to be able to almost like go to work and not be mm. in my near my kitchen or near the family room um but it's also good one also good thing about remote work which is great for us editors but also you have to be careful if people don't abuse it is that you can be responsive you know how many times i would work at the disney studio and edit and submit it for them to review heading home and I'm in rush hour. Oh, can you change this? Can you take that period out and make an exclamation point in the graphic? And I'm in, I'm already in traffic and have to turn back around and go redo it and upload it. Now, when those silly last minute changes come, if you're at home, if you feel like you can go and do it really quick and upload it right away, it's not that big a deal. So that's the, so, or or when you're waiting for a client that's three hour different time zone, like I'm in Florida and they're in LA, Mm -hmm three hour time difference, they may not get you your notes until nine o'clock at night. And I know that that's okay. I'll go watch the office or play call of duty for a couple hours. And at nine o'clock when that note come, I'm expecting it. That's fine. I'm already home anyway. So there's a lot of advantages to working remotely if you can as an editor. And then the best part is it's becoming more acceptable now, especially since COVID. And people are like, yeah, we're fine with that. I love that. (laughs) Shelby yes. asked another. Make that question. she said she said a edit suite. That that is a great idea. Before I moved in this house, I was actually trying to look into adding a, a place that was a separate entrance to the house for that purpose. And also, it's sometimes good to get away from the house if you can, because mm. in a work work mindset, even if it's just across the yard. <laughs> Have you ever worked with music supervisors, sound designers, editors? And if so, what did that collaboration look like? Okay, well, this project here behind me is, is, is this three editors working on this and there's about four graphic designers doing animations and doing the, um, that's an actual animated piece there. So the question, how, how was that? What was that like? I'm not what sure. The collaboration of working with the music supervisors and editors the sound editors look like? I haven't had the, the experience or advantage working with music, a music supervisor yet, but I've worked with sound editors, graphic designers. Um, and I love it when I can get all those categories. I love this project because it's designers doing the graphic. I'm an editor. I can mess around with graphics. When somebody else is doing it, it's going to be much better. And, and it allows me to focus on my storytelling with the, with the footage. 
what has happened is because these computers are so powerful and they can do everything now, they expect the editor to do everything a lot of times. The bigger the budget is, more likely you're going to have these roles and hats, you know, uh, distributed or what's that word when you send work to other people? Delegated. Delegated. <laughs> but um, in lower budget, is they're going to expect you to create those lower third graphics or create the animations. And there's some editors who can do all that. I've found that you have really great editors who can't do graphics and you have really great and who can play with graphics and there's some mm -hmm. great designers who can be, make beautiful art, but really can't edit or tell the story to save their lives. And there are some people that say they do both, but I still feel like they're always better at one or the other. Cause I think it's two sides of your brain that kind of do that sometimes. But uh, the thing I keep, I always like to tell people when you talk about graphics though, is uh, you're editing, remember it's, don't just show me what your computer can do. Tell the story first. And sometimes less is more. Mm -hmm. But um, when you have an opportunity like this to work with a collaborative team, when they're doing all those graphics and it makes me focus on the edit. I love it when there's someone doing the music because the hardest thing in the world is picking the music. And you can spend all week editing something to a music a track and then the client, oh, can we change the song? And that can change your whole edit because you, you may have edited to that beat, to that cadence that rhythm and now they just change the song so whenever you can have someone else in charge of the music and they can give you that first i can work with that i love that whenever i can so i love having somebody else do graphics somebody else do music um, or sound editing and don't skip on the sound when you're editing goodness <laughs> sound is most almost more important than your picture these cameras are so forgiving now and this since YouTube and social media, people are more forgiving when the camera's shaky or if it's not perfectly exposed. But you can't forgive bad audio. The biggest, the biggest um, clue when you're looking at low budget is usually the sound. Now and you can hear it right away. You hear it right away. Now, typical audience won't get it. They might not know why this seems amateur, but us professionals will, but it's usually the audio. That's one of the things that can can really make your piece look professional or look amateur. Never skip on the audio when you can. Put, put as much effort into that as you do all the lighting. Why spend all that time lighting the set? And then you, then it sounds like, like you're in an echo chamber because you didn't have, put a lavalier or use a boom. So don't skip on the sound when you can. And then edit the sound, mix it smoothly. Well, we're coming up on seven o'clock. So uh, Michael has one last question in here. If you think you could answer it really fast about what advice would you give regarding hardware, PC type, and software uh, that you consider industry standard? Uh, Michael, how am I going to do that in three minutes? You know, that's, that's like, that's like man, am I a liberal or conservative? You know, you can't even do that. No, well, you know, it's, but when you look at you, when you look at the, you know, the situation you have behind you, you're essentially in the bat cave. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you've got all your screens and, and, and uh, awesome stuff. Now we're all, obviously we're all on various different levels um, coming into yeah. this uh, with full sale. You know, we're all, we're all, you know, equipped with, with different things to begin with. And some of us later on, uh, you know, we acquire our MacBook pros and, and our, our cameras and things like that. Um, so, so that's one of those things when we look to somebody like you, who's, who's, built up, um, you know, your, your arsenal of equipment that you're working with, you can't help but ask yourself, what are, what is he working with? What, what does he consider to be the industry standard? Where, what does he go to? What is his go-to application when doing his film, you know, in video editing? Um, I, I'm on Mac. I'm using a Mac. I have a Mac pro, the tower. Um, and I have a bunch of monitors. So let me try to see how to answer your question. So can you be more specific again? And I can answer. Well, like for instance, are you, are you utilizing, let's say Adobe Premiere? Yes. Uh, for most of your editing? I'm using Adobe Premiere uh, okay. for my editing. Awesome. Adobe is on PC and Mac. I, I thought you were going, I saw PC at first. I thought you were meaning PC versus Mac. That's why I'm in. No, I no, no, I'm, I'm mostly. Yeah, but, okay, no problem. I'm on, no problem. A Mac. <laughs> I'm on a Mac and I'm using Adobe Premiere, which can be on both. Fantastic. Um, and it's a great one to get in. And uh, and also I learned in Avid in college, but I haven't used it in 15 years. I'm, I decided I'm going to go back and catch touch up on Avid again. 
So, and depending on what type of shows you or work you're doing, it's going to determine what software you're going to need. I know in, in uh, episodic TV, my, my friend who's a exec producer uh, in LA or in, for NBC says episodic TV, you got to do it on an app. Um, that's just what they do. I know a lot of, a lot of TV news still uses Avid, but Premiere is what I use. Um, Avid, Premiere, they kind of basically work the same. The only one that's really different is Final Cut 10. Um, the new Final Cut changed the whole game. I used to be on Final Cut until they went to 10 because they changed their whole setup. Now, if you've only used Final Cut 10, you can learn that quickly. I know it's fast and it works well, and you could probably learn the other ones easier. Us guys who've been using the other way, that way Avid and Premiere works, is so different. It was kind of hard to wrap our brains around it. Like, yeah, I can't yeah. even do iMovie. So yeah. hardware-wise, these laptops are powerful. Get a powerful laptop if you don't have the space, or or especially if it's a Mac, get a laptop, and then get a get, get a bunch of monitors. Definitely have your external monitors. Yeah, you got to do that. that real yep. estate. And that's Excellent. not a huge, well, thank you. That's not thank a huge you so much. If you go on PC, you can do that. The same way, and it'd be a little cheaper PC, probably. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you going into that. Um, Jess, if you, I, I asked about someone asked about my LinkedIn, and yes, I don't mind sharing that. Did I give that to you before? Uh, I don't believe you did. If you want to drop that in the chat, or yeah, I'll put whatever. You... I mean, yeah, I'm I, I'm fine it because I know I can or go other over. format if you want to connect in another way. I'll put, I don't mind email and I don't mind my Instagram. All right. But, um, and LinkedIn, I'm on by my name, but, but like, I don't do LinkedIn that much. I need to do better. Look, I'm going to put it in the chat. Yeah. I don't think you and I are even connected on LinkedIn. Yeah. But I need to do more of that. But yeah, like I said, if anyone had any questions, want to, my, I put my, where it says this be Jonah, that's the Instagram. Um, and you can reach me there or LinkedIn. I absolutely don't mind. I guess I enjoyed this. Yeah, it was great having you. Do you have any final thoughts you want to leave off with? Or No, because I do, but I can't do it in five seconds. So <laughs> You could do three minutes. <laughs> Since we started five minutes after, we'll aim for seven. I like that five. last question I just had. Was it Joel um, who was asking about the gear? I'm sorry, I didn't get to that earlier. Because I, I think I, I could answer a lot about that. But I guess you're not all editors, so maybe it's not relevant to everyone. But you can you can always email me those those gear and equipment questions and camera questions too. Remember, I shoot as well. So I don't know if any of you are camera people. Um, if you could put in your chat the different areas you all want to do, I would love to just see that before I go. Oh, you sent that directly to me. Oh. Can't. If I could copy that. Oh, I thought it, I didn't realize it was, oh, I got to click everyone. Okay, there you go. We have an editor. Oh, we both double. Yeah, that's camera work, editors, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, well, Jeff, great, this was copy. definitely your. I didn't, I didn't paste it right, please copy it so people can reach me, yeah. Where is, is everybody at? Your target audience. <laughs> Anybody ever saw my show? I'm just curious because I, the age people, they're all grown. Now. All those kids are grown now. <laughs> we have one in Kissimmee. So local. Uh, I know Mike Canley, one of the instructors, he said he saw your show. Uh, he was talking about this yesterday. Oh. <laughs> He's an instructor? He's an instructor. He, oh, wow. That's crazy. That he is... said his son <laughs> used to watch <laughs> <laughs> Um, I didn't talk about camera. I just posted. I have I I shoot with the Sony system now. I have a Sony FX9 and A7S. Uh, I think a lot of you might be working with the FX6, which is great. I actually wish I had that. I bought the nine before the six came out. I would have bought the six if I knew about it before. <laughs> um, since we were talking about gear. Well, if nobody else has any final questions, I think. Uh, that's probably a good spot to wrap it. Um, it was great having you. Thanks for joining us tonight. You're welcome, everyone. I hope I was, I hope I gave you advice. Uh, I like to talk and it's kind of hard to bring it concise, but I hope that it was worth your time. It, it was definitely informative. I'm going to stop the record and